This episode sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Welcome to the True Facts Animal Awards. Celebrating animals with awards. There's this lab called the Wainwright Lab at UC Davis. They're a bit obsessed with fish skulls. Not in a dirty way. I mean, maybe in a dirty way, but they don't talk about that on the website. I mean, that might be what this interested in joining us link leads to. Anyway, they have a bunch of videos of a variety of fishes eating. Let's take this one for example. We'll stop it here and I want you to imagine what will happen next. Now you might imagine it like how a tuna do. Pretty straightforward, the tuna opens its mouth and then sort of swims into what it's eating. Or you might imagine something closer to this moray eel. Same sort of thing, the jaw opens up, but in this case it bites down. But look at this one. Instead of the jaw opening on a simple hinge, this looks more like someone setting up one of those pop-up tents on the beach. And the more you look at these in slow motion, the weirder it gets. And this is because most fish suck. They also use suction to feed. Now fish skulls are made out of an elephant shitload of parts. One thing these parts can do is rotate and move to expand the volume inside the head. This expansion creates lower pressure and suction. And listen, these fish can do a good bit of sucking. Here's one where they tied the food to something that measures force. And you can watch the fish slowly get more and more pissed off. <laughs> Now it can get even more complicated because some of these fish have a sort of double jointed lower jaw and that can result in some pretty strange movements. Like this one here. <laughs> some fish create lower pressure by elongating their jaws. And in that category there's none better than the sling jaw wrasse. It can extend its jaw an additional 65% of its head length. Now most of these fish eat their prey whole, which means that after they suck the prey into their mouth hole, they need to get it into their esophagus and tum-tums before it swims back out. For that, they have a friggin' second set of jaws. These pharyngeal jaws seem to help get the prey down the chute. And they're even more important for the fish that don't really use suction. Like that moray eel we saw earlier. They have some serious pharyngeal jaws. It's terrifying, it's like there's a fish inside the fish. If you look close, you can see it in action, pulling the food back and towards the throat. Here's another shot of it. It's like a hand comes out. Now while the Slingjaw Rass wins the Over the Top Award in the category, there's another Rass that's sucking adorable. The Tube-Lip Rass is a bit more understated. Look at it giving that coral little kisses. But the thing about coral is that they are cynodarians, like jellyfish, and they're covered in tiny little stinging cells. These nematocysts are little spring-loaded poison-filled harpoons. So to be able to give a coral a kiss requires some special lips. On the left are the lips of a typical non-coral feeding wrasse. On the right are the very puckered and kissable lips of the tube-lip wrasse. These lips fold in on themselves over and over again like the gills of a mushroom. And those indentations are lined with goblet cells. And you know what they make? Mucus. It's like having a chapstick built into your lip parts. Now there's another fish that likes to live among nematocyst-filled stinging tentacles, the clownfish. And guess what? They're covered in mucus. That's right, in real life, little Nemo was a snot boy. In both these cases, the mucus seems to protect the fish from those stinging cells. But in the case of the tube lip wrasse, those puckery lips and the mucus allow the fish to create a tight seal on the coral, so it can suck. And you know what it's after? It seems to like to eat the mucus that coral make. This is a very special corner of underwater pornography. <laughs> but before we get to the fish that really know how to suck, let's look at the category cheapest escape room. If you want some inspiration in your life, I've got the beetle for you. Right here, Regim Bardia Attenuata. We'll call him Reggie. There's Reggie right- oh shit. Well that's a real bummer right there. Oh, I mean something like that happens to you, most people they just give up. But not Reggie. Let's have a look-see to see what he gets up to. That's right, crawled his way right out of a frog's ass. Puts things into perspective, doesn't it? And I'll tell you, that frog's a bit nonchalant considering what just happened. I'd be chalant, I'd be very fucking chalant if a beetle just crawled out my ass. Anyway, it turns out that Reggie can go right through a frog. Oh, now you notice. <laughs> they included a picture of what Reggie's Google Maps looks like. <laughs> I like the caption. <laughs> it's a hypothetical escape route. <laughs> Were there other options? <laughs> anyway, it turns out that Reggie's pretty damn good at clawing his way through the pipings of a frog. And you know what's at the far end? A sphincter. He'd come all that way and now he's got to tickle open a sphincter, or however he does it. Then he finally gets out, thinks his day's getting better, but then it turns out there's someone out there got the whole thing on video. Explain that to your butt. Whoa! We're gonna have to slow that down. <laughs> he almost ate it again. Look at his reaction. <laughs> it's like, nope, nope. 
let me tell you, you should subscribe to Curiosity Stream. I mean, you're watching a show about how fish suck. You're obviously in the market for some good programming. <laughs> well, Curiosity Stream has thousands of original documentary films, shows, and series that you can't find anywhere else. And like the name says, it's for the curious, with a focus on science, history, and technology. Look at this one right here. It's a series called Nature's Mathematics. You can learn about hexagons and why bees use them. Turns out if you make six of them, you get a seventh for free. And hexagons are also part of the deterministic chaos of snowflakes. Right there, you got a whole evening of cocktail banter. And if you need a little help figuring out what to watch, Curiosity Stream has a whole bunch of collections around a variety of themes. There really is so much, and new things get added each week. Go to curiositystream.com. You can get monthly or annual plans, and it's incredibly affordable. Use code ZEFRANK for 25% off when you sign up. It's a great deal for great content, which you can watch on almost any platform or device. Curiosity Stream has been a longtime sponsor, and I'm a fan. Check them out today. Where were we? Oh, right. A number of fish use suction to hold on to things. Some use their mouths, seems like the obvious choice. Others, like the mudskipper or leaping blenny, have fused pectoral fins, which they can use like a little suction cup. The remora, however, took this idea of fin modification and really swam with it. In this case, it wasn't the pectoral fins, but rather the dorsal fin on top. And apparently you can make whatever the f*** you want by modifying a fin. Thusly, the top of the remora's head looks a bit like evolution stepped on it with a medium-tread hiking boot. But with it, they can attach themselves to whatever the hell they want to. This suction pad is basically made out of two parts. There's this outside fleshy lip oval which looks a bit like a suction cup, and then inside you can see these rows of things that are called lamellae. If you look closer at the lamellae, you can see that they're covered by thousands of these little blunt spikes. They almost look like the teeth of a comb. At rest, they all sort of lie flat against the fish, but they can be rotated so they stick out at an angle from the remora's back. Watch as this remora attaches to the glass. You can see those thousands of spikes angling and making contact with the surface. All of this keeps the remora from sliding as oncoming water pushes it backwards. Of course, if they want to slide, they can just pull back those little spikes. Now, in order to stay on the surface of the host fish, they need some help from that fleshy lip. When the remora attaches, it pushes up against the host and expels water from underneath that disc. Then those lamellae rotate and the spikes push on the surface, and all of this creates lower pressure and suction. But the seal has to remain tight. Luckily, remoras are dickheads. You see, they have these blood vessels that run along that fleshy lip, and they have a sort of valve that can stop the blood from exiting. And by doing that, they can make that outside seal more rigid, which is the same sort of mechanism as a mammalian erection. See? Dickhead. And if they want to let go, they just take a cold shower, think of kittens, relax that head boner, and peel up from the front. Anyway, they're constantly making little adjustments, attaching and reattaching. Look at these ones riding on a whale. Even when they're moving this fast, they can lift off the surface for a moment. At the right height, water moves more quickly in the gap between the remora and the whale, and the ensuing lower pressure pulls the remora back to the surface of the whale. It's called the Venturi effect, and quite frankly, it looks fun. <laughs> Whoa! But the thing about hitchhiking on whales is you're going where they're going, and they go down. This remora on the right was taken down to 1,400 meters. You let go down there, you f***ed. Luckily, remoras know what parts of the whale have the lowest drag, and that's where they hang out for the ride. Now, overall, most of these remora host relationships are win-win. The remoras take care of some parasites, and in return, they might get a fish at feeding time, they get their travel for free, and the host offers some protection against the remora's predators. There's a big asterisk on that statement. We'll get back to that in a second. But listen, sometimes the host is just not that into it. Might want some alone time. And sometimes those remoras attach themselves in awkward places. Like this one right here, it's near the genital slit. And I think we can all agree you don't want a fish on your genital slit. So there's actually a paper on the physics of how dolphins spin to get remoras off. Not like get them off, but <laughs> remove them from their body. Anyway, about that asterisk. If you want protection from predators, you have to choose the right host. I mean, this one may look like an idiot, but at least that host has poison in it. I mean, the whale shark, you might be thinking, well, at least it's big. But if your predator's a f***ing bird, they're not gonna do sh** for you. I mean, you're basically on a whale-shaped plate. <laughs> but look how hard that cormoran has to work. And that is why the remora wins, the fish that sucks the most. Mm -hmm. Finally, we have the category, how to get your hole stuffed. Oh, stop it. This right here is an Egyptian vulture. 
It's quite a striking bird, isn't it? With the white feathers and the face that has holes in it. <laughs> Once in a while, these vultures, both males and females, like to get gussied up a bit. What they do is they find a mud puddle and get all intimate with it. Look at that, right up in there. And this mud stains their front feathers red. It's thought that what they're doing is basically changing their looks by applying a cosmetic. Maybe as a status symbol or something to do with mating. And these birds aren't alone. The Japanese crested ibis does something similar. Normally they're quite white, with a touch of a pinkish hue. But during mating season, many of their feathers turn to a grey. In this case, it's not a mud bath. They actually secrete a tar-like substance from their face parts. And then they smear it all over the rest of themselves. You know, you make your own cosmetics. Like using what comes out your pimples for moisturizer. Now I know what you're going to say about the greater flamingo. That pink comes from what they eat. And it does. The shellfish they eat have carotenoids in them. And when ingested, those are incorporated into their feathers. But there's a problem. The sun bleaches those feathers. And you don't want that. You don't want to be the pale flamingo during mating season. Luckily, like most birds, they're equipped with this little nipply thing back near the base of their tail. It's called a uropageal gland, and it secretes an oil. And you've seen birds use it when they preen, rub their beak on their little oily nipple and spread it around to get their feathers right. Well, in the greater flamingo, that oil also contains carotenoids. So during mating season, flamingos use it like a rouge. Touch up those faded feathers and stay sexy. Just a quick note, remember that vulture that takes the mud baths? Well, its beak is yellow, also because of carotenoids. But unlike the flamingo who gets it from a raw bar, the vultures get their carotenoids by eating ungulate shit. Anyway, spotless starlings are next level with the makeup, and they start at quite a young age. You see, when the mother starling comes back to the nest with a fat worm, this is what she sees. It's a little disturbing, actually. The mother has to figure out which hole to drop it in, and ideally chooses the ones that have the best chance at survival. All right, so here's what happens when mommy's away. You can see the babies are preening themselves almost before they have anything to preen. But look at this. See that tube? It's filled with what a science hippie collected out of the baby's uropageal gland. And if you cotton swab around the baby's mouth, guess what comes off? Yellow lipstick. And what's more, the shade of the lipstick seems to correspond to the baby's health, which gives the mummy bird a clue on which hole to stuff. See, stuffing holes isn't always dirty. What's that, Jerry? You want to see the what? No, Jerry, it's asterisk, not asterix. Well, I'm sorry you're disappointed. No, I don't want to see... What is that, a roll of quarters? Okay. Oh, you swallowed them individually? But then how'd you get them in the roll, Jerry? Well, that is a trick, isn't it? Asterix. Asterix.